we can find four buckets where our responsibilities can land. So our job description, but I would rather call it a ministry description, our ministry description is going to be principally four specific responsibilities. And if what we're doing cannot fit into one of those four responsibilities or buckets, it's not for us to do. It's for somebody else to do. So let's go to the book of Acts, and I'm going to try to write some things here on a screen. Uh, and uh, what we want to do is call this um, uh, an elder's ministry description. All right, so first of all, let's go over to Acts. We're going to be in chapter 6, and specifically in verses 1 through 7. Now, what we find there happens to be uh, a conflict. We're in Jerusalem. Uh, the church has not yet uh, gone through its persecution, dividing it into many different uh, territories. But here in verse 1, chapter 6, the Greek-speaking widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. And that word overlooked is in a particular tense of Greek that means that they didn't go to bed hungry just on one occasion. They went to bed hungry night after night after night. It was a recurring problem. The apostles sought to do something about it. And that something was, hey, choose from among your number men, seven men who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them. So then we read that seven men were chosen. They all had Greek names. We know this text well. But what I want us to focus on is that the apostles said, we will devote our ministry, and that word ministry is a form of the word diakonos. We're, go we're going to be serving in the area of, here it is, prayer, and the Word of God. So we call this first area of responsibility, prayer and preaching. Now these are all going to begin with the letter P so that I can remember them. I have to do things <laughs> as a memory tool so that I can recall it easily. The apostles they were going to devote themselves to overseeing the ministry of prayer and the preaching of the Word of God or teaching of the Word of God. It doesn't mean that they and they alone did all of the praying, but they were going to be responsible that praying was happening. They weren't just going to be a church that prayed. They were going to be a praying church. There is a difference. And as elders, we have to be certain that we are a praying church church, that it's a part of our spiritual DNA in the local bride. As well, it is our responsibility to not merely see that preaching or teaching of the Word of God is being done, but that we are many times doing that preaching and teaching. For example, at the creek, I am an elder who preaches. My role here is as an elder, 1 Timothy chapter 5, who happens to be preaching. Uh, very similarly, when we look in 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter said, I appeal to you as a fellow elder. Peter was an elder who preached. He, as a matter of fact, he delivered the first sermon on the day of Pentecost in the church. So responsibility, number one, as elders in our ministry description, we oversee prayer and the preaching and or teaching the delivery of the Word of God. Now let's go over to chapter 15 in Acts, chapter 15. And here we have the Jerusalem Council. The entire chapter is the Jerusalem Council, except for that little bit of an argument that happens towards the end between Paul and Barnabas. Now, to set up the context before we look at the content, remember Paul and Barnabas, they were serving in Antioch. The church back in chapter 11 sent Paul, excuse me, Barnabas to Antioch. And once there, he was overwhelmed with how the Lord was moving so mightily among the people. He went to Tarsus. He brought Saul, Paul back. 
and they began teaching and preaching the Word of God. Many people came to Christ. Many people grew into fully devoted followers of Jesus. Now, what you and I want to understand is, after the Holy Spirit sent them out, the beginning of chapter 13, they came back to check on things in Antioch, and they discovered, chapter 15, that things were not as good as when they had left. What was happening, somebody had gotten into the church in Antioch, and they were teaching that you could not become a follower of Jesus unless you obeyed the law of Moses, that you would become circumcised, and so on. This brought about such a sharp disagreement between Paul, Barnabas, Peter, as well as then the party of the Pharisees, that they went to Jerusalem and they appealed to not just the apostles, but you'll notice the elders. Verse 4, they reported to the apostles and elders everything that God had done through them. So they're going to make this presentation, and somebody listening in was none other than James, who we often refer to as the chief elder there in Jerusalem. Now, what happens is he listens to all of the different positions, and then he says, it is my judgment, therefore, verse 19, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to Christ. He then says, we're going to write something up. We're going to send that back to Antioch. And uh, exactly that is accomplished. Paul and Barnabas, they take this letter from James, the elders, the apostles of the church in Jerusalem, and they implement it. So what Acts 15 teaches us, beginning in verse 1 and following, verse 1 and following, is that a second primary responsibility in your ministry description and mine is that of establishing policy. That we are the ones who establish policy. We hand that off then to the staff, and they... They lead with authority as they stay within the lines of that policy. Let me give you an example. So many years ago here at the Creek, uh, individuals uh, were oftentimes uh, selected to teach and to lead, whether it was a Sunday school class, a Bible study, an in-home uh, in uh, life group. Uh, and as they did so, the elders knew them. But as the church grew, uh, it became impossible for the elders to know everyone. So as elders, we wrote a policy for those who are selected to teach the Word of God, to lead life groups, and so on. And we handed that written policy off to the minister of education. And then uh, as it was handed off to his team, he and his team, all they had to do was follow the lines of that policy, and they could select then the people who uh, would be leading in those areas. So policies are established by the elders, and the elders hand that off with authority, not just responsibility, but with authority to the staff to then lead the church on a day-to-day -day basis. We establish policy. We lead in prayer and the preaching of the word. Let's go over to chapter 20 of Acts. In Acts chapter 20, uh, this is uh, the text where Paul turns in his letter of resignation to the elders in Ephesus. If you'll notice in verse uh, 17, from Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. And when they arrived, he said to them, you know how I had lived the whole time that I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and so on. Now, this is his farewell address. And as he bids farewell, uh, as he bids farewell, he, in verse 28, is going to give them two very specific charges. And those two very specific charges are, number one, guard yourselves, which means there's a protection element. A protection element. That's very important. 
Guard yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. So there was uh, an important responsibility to protect the flock. And then finally, chapter 20, same passage, verse 28, be shepherds. There's an element of pastoral care, responsibility to provide pastoral care. The shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock, even from your own number, even from among the elders. Men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So, verse 31, be on your guard. Be on your guard. What we find then is uh, this very clear list of responsibilities in the book of Acts that were given to elders. And when you and I take all of the many things on our to-do list as elders, and we try to compartmentalize them into one of those four buckets we can work all the more effectively as elders. So at the creek, for example, our elder meetings, uh, many times we'll be right here in this room. This is the E2, Effective Elder Office at the creek. And we will meet here. And our agenda, we have a written agenda. It's got four categories on it. It'll have prayer and preaching. It will have on it protection of the flock. It will have on it policy, and it will have on it pastoral care. And then as items are brought to us for discussion, they have to fall into one of those four categories. And if they don't fall into a category effectively, they're not for us to do. An example would be, uh, so here at the Creek, we are doing uh, remodeling in different parts of the campus. And if the elders were prone to want to look at the blueprints or want to go over the, the design concept, we're not going to do it. We have delegated that to somebody else, and we're not going to take time to go over that. Likewise, similarly, budgets we don't, or uh, financial statements. We don't look at financial statements. In our elder meetings, we've given that to somebody else. There are people, CPAs, attorneys, et cetera, people who are business executives, people who have these skills and abilities, and they have been given not only a job to do in this regard, but they've been given the authority by which to fulfill those responsibilities. Uh, and we want to push things off from our plate so that we can truly focus on prayer and preaching, policy, protecting the flock, and that would involve church discipline, by the way, as well as pastoral care. Now, there's no way that we as individuals, there are eight of us as elders at the creek, there's no way that we can provide all of the pastoral care to over 4,000 people. It's impossible. So as we grew from 250 and onward, we had to reinvent, reinvent, reinvent pastoral care because we believe that that was a major responsibility uh, under our oversight. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't make hospital calls or it doesn't mean that we do not uh, work with hurting marriages or people who are struggling uh, with grief and so on. We are in the homes of people. We are in the hospitals making calls. We are at the nursing home seeing individuals who are struggling. We make pastoral calls, but we also have recruited people who have the gift of mercy and encouragement. We've trained them. We've equipped them them and then we have deployed them and the people of our congregation know that these individuals are coming in the name of Christ to provide pastoral care. What we will often say is we may not be the ones who render, who bring to you that care, but we will promise you that you will be cared for. It's our responsibility to oversee pastoral care, to be engaged to train, equip, release people, empowering them to provide pastoral care. So we try to stay within these four primary areas of responsibility, and we then pattern our ministry after them. Now, a part of this is accountability. 
uh, at the creek, as elders, we practice peer accountability. And case in point, I just received this from our elder chair. It came in my e-box uh, just a couple of days ago, and this is our annual peer accountability form. David, our elder chair, sent it to all of us as elders, and we have to complete it before March the 31st in writing. It's very lengthy. It asks for uh, each of us to to describe this last year how we served as elders. We do an individual assessment. We then send it to David uh, by March the 31st, and in early April, we will have an evening meeting where the eight of us will sit. We will have read each other's review, and then we hold each other's feet to the fire in terms of peer accountability. And uh, that's then how we can raise the bar of effectiveness as we speak into each other's lives in that regard. So, yes, we have four responsibilities. Yes, we keep them ever before us. Every meeting, we keep talking about those four responsibilities. And then annually, we do a peer evaluation to determine how well we are serving Jesus, how well we are serving his bride here, how well we are serving as brothers one to another in the role of elder. And um, that would be our job description. I know that was a lot of material all at once, but I wanted to keep it as simply stated as possible. Any questions, Tim, that you might have uh, received by any chance? Yeah, thank you, Gary. That's great uh, synopsis of those buckets. I think guys are writing notes. Uh, you may want to hit uh, the whiteboard and, and just leave that up there for a second. If right. you guys taking notes as you called. We do have one question that's come in so far, but I want to encourage the guys uh, to, to submit any other questions that we may be able to get to. Uh, but the first question has to do with uh, any recommendations for the number of, of elders relative to uh, the church size. This mm -hmm. question was, how many elders for a church of 400? But I think we could stretch that out to, is there any principle that you would give for a church of 100 versus 200 versus 400? And so right. on. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think that the greater emphasis needs to be on the sense of calling. Uh, do elders have a sense of being called of the Holy Spirit to serve in this uh, capacity? as opposed to being nominated and then later elected into that responsibility or office. Uh, so if in the church there are uh, a, a few hundred people and we don't have a very many men uh, stepping up to the plate, sensing that call, rather than just fill those chairs with men, uh, I believe that we are, we're going to actually hurt an environment if we're not refilling the leadership pipeline with men who have been trained, men who have been equipped, but most importantly, men who have been called, prompted by the Holy Spirit to serve in that capacity. Now, a, a, another thought in this regard, if we have too many men serving as elders, then we're not going to be able to convene a meeting, and when I say a meeting, I don't mean just to have a meeting. We, case in point, every one of our elders meeting, uh, it begins with a meal. We bring in a meal, we sit down, and we have table fellowship. Table fellowship was very important uh, in the day of Jesus, and we want to be in the deepest of relationship one with another as elders. So we have friendship outside of an elders meeting. Uh, hence, if we have 12, 15 elders, and uh, there's never a time when everybody has their feet under the table that is hurtful uh, to this team. Uh, I knew, uh, now this brother of mine who uh, used to be a, a preacher, he is now gone home to be with the Lord Jesus, but I remember him uh, being pleased that he had over 20 elders in his church, and he saw that as uh, something very positive, but and when I would ask him, well, how, how do you possibly get everybody there for a meeting, and uh, how do you do life together in community, and that wasn't 
important uh, in that context. So I believe that there can be too many elders. Uh, and again, too, if there are several hundred in the church or a couple few thousand in the church, and we were working on ratios, at some point in time, that ratio will not work. It has to be about relationship, and not only relationship with each other, uh, manageable relationship, it also has to be uh, a relationship with the congregation where they see this team, this band of brothers, uh, who can then equip and release people to serve uh, the body of Christ. Uh, I don't see anywhere in the New Testament writings where there is a number, a ratio that can help us answer that question. All right, Gary, that's a great answer because I, I think a lot of people think of a particular number. Uh, so that's a good principle. We've got another couple questions I'm going to combine here. When you talked about delegating finances away to get that out of the elder's bucket. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the question, kind of a two-part question would be, how do you then keep the financial team accountable? Mm -hmm. And uh, how, do, are you privy to the finances uh, or what level of decisions do you and elders make about the finances? Sure. What a great question. Uh, what we have done, we have uh, a team, this, if we go back many, many, many years into the early 1990s, um, here we had what was called uh, a church council, for lack of a better term, a church board, and they met separate from the elders. And uh, that board no longer exists because people who were on that board, uh, i.e. deacons or whomever, uh, there have been over the years people hired who oversee different areas of ministry. Now, what we have is a management team, and our governing documents require us to have a management team. Uh, it exists with about five or six people on it. They meet monthly. We have on that team the chairman of the elder by uh, requirement. He has to be on that management team. And oddly enough, right now we also have another elder on that team. Um, the other people on that team are finance-related, gifted, skilled, business-minded folk. And they, let me tell you, let me give you an example of how the budget is developed. So, and we are right now in that process because uh, we are on a July 1 to June 30 fiscal year. We have to present to the congregation in May our proposed operating budget for the next fiscal year in keeping with the state of Indiana's not-for-profit regulations. So, uh, after January the 1st, an email goes out to our staff from our operations minister uh, that it's time to begin developing the next budget. And so what we have then are ministers with budget responsibilities, and they look at the next fiscal year, they draw up the budget uh, in their given area, they give it back then to this executive minister over operations. He looks at it, and Kevin, he in his earlier career was a CPA, he crunches the numbers and whatnot, and when he works then with these ministers to fine tune that draft, then Kevin takes that to the management team and Kevin sits on the management team as executive minister of operations. Then the management team, they have to fine tune it. They have to test it to see if it is a legitimate workable budget. And once they then put their final stamp of approval on it, they send it to the elders for elder approval. And this is the only document financially that we look at during the course of an entire year. We look at it, we know that it's coming to us from the management team. The management team is charged with the fiscal oversight of the church. We know that it's going to be fine-tuned. We know that it's going to be a responsible financial document and we will approve that for presentation to the congregation at the annual meeting in May. Then in May, at that meeting, what we do is we ask the congregation to approve, approve the proposed operating budget for the next fiscal year, 2017-2018, as presented, it'll say, as presented by the elders. We didn't draft it. We didn't compile it. We had people who lead in ministry areas, get the ball started, 
then it was fine-tuned by people who have fiscal skills, and then we, as the spiritual leaders of the church, the, the team that's responsible to the state of Indiana for approving this, asked our congregation to approve, affirm, affirm that budget. So uh, we, we have a representative currently, two, on that management team uh, who know that every month there's going to be a report coming from operations looking at all of the business aspects of the church, the legal aspects of the church uh, for review. And if there's anything that is of concern, it comes to the elders. In our bio, our governing laws, for example, uh, we have a clause that permits that management team to conduct business on behalf of the creek to a certain dollar amount. Then after that certain dollar amount, it has to go to the elders and they can only act to a certain dollar amount before it goes to the entire congregation. Right now we are in process of selling some excess land that we own and uh, the management team, uh, they are able to handle that. But if the, if the um, quote on the property uh, for sale gets to a certain dollar level, then they're going to, you, uh, they're going to exceed their uh, dollar uh, limit and it's going to have to be bumped to the elders just because of the way the governing documents are written. All right, Gary, this is switching gears completely, but I'm kind of getting to answer the questions or ask the questions kind of as they came in, first come, first serve. Uh, uh, one of our uh, attendees would like you to talk briefly about your process for recruiting new elders uh -huh. compared to what the, the guys that you currently have on the team. Yes, uh -huh. uh, this is a, uh, a concern always, not only to us, but I believe it's a concern in churches all across the United States and around the world. Uh, if you are familiar with E2 Effective Elders, if you have attended the events there sponsored by Waypoint, uh, then you know that we have curriculum available and we are always writing curriculum about this very issue. I, I know that from just this last fall, taking another uh, construction team of guys from the creek to Fairbanks, Alaska to help a sister church build a building, we went and we saw once again the pipeline. The oil pipeline that was built in 1977 used to move oil in only three days from uh, Prudhoe Bay in uh, the North Slope to um, the uh, uh, terminal in Valdez, 800 miles away. Now, what happened uh, over years was a decline in the quantity of oil being moved in that pipe. It doesn't take three days any longer. It takes 14 days to go from the North Slope to Valdez. Now, the problem with that is because the oil is flowing at a much slower rate because there is so little oil in that pipeline. Its capacity is uh, much greater. It can, it can move much more oil than it is. When the oil company's official said that to us, I got to thinking about our pipeline. We have a leadership pipeline that is running dangerously low right now. We don't have a whole lot of people uh, applying for admission to our colleges and seminaries to become the next generation of preachers and missionaries and teachers and so on. Likewise, we don't have a whole lot of guys standing up in line to become the next generation of elders in the local church. So a concern of mine is that um, uh, we as individuals actively recruit to refill that pipeline. How we do it here is uh, this way. We are always looking for men who are already exemplifying the work of an elder, that they already have a life of character where they are walking closely with God, they already have a healthy marriage and family, that they already are feeding people spiritually. They might be leading a life group, they might be teaching a class, they may be uh, in some way, shape or form uh, leading one of our Bible studies. We're watching for these guys to see if there is a shepherd's heart within them, that they're already providing pastoral care for people in that class or that life group, where they are manifesting the, the heart of an elder. And when we spot them, 
when we see them, we then, as a group of elders, begin making this list of names, and we are praying over them, and then we approach them to see if those men would enter into a time of study. Case in point, the first book in our series is called Call, or excuse me, Answer, Answer His Call, and uh, we walk with them through that to see if the Holy Spirit may be urging them, stirring them to serve Jesus in this capacity. And if so, then we will walk with them through that study. And if they wish to continue, then we go into that next uh, category of reflect his character and so on. So it's a matter of looking and watching uh, for men who show the propensity of serving in this capacity and then drawing alongside of them to begin that walk of preparation. There we go. I have to remember to unmute myself every time I, I come on. Um, it, just by the way, is the transmission working all right? Well, for me, uh, there's a little bit of kick up here and there, but you're doing great. Okay. Um, the next question that was submitted said, uh, you talked about that peer evaluation form, which, first of all, I want to tell our, uh, our participants today that um, you'll receive a, an email tomorrow with a, with a little bit of summary of our meeting, and in it will be a link to Gary's website, uh, e2elders.org, uh, and there are resources like the books that he, the curriculum that he just described, and, th and things like that that you'd be interested in will be in an email that will automatically be sent to all of our participants tomorrow. And yeah. so you can find some of those things as resources on the website. Correct. And if, if I can just point out, if you go to the link for products, in that products link, and then scroll down, you will see our governing documents. It, it's an elder policy document, and it's absolutely free. You just click on that, and you can download an e set of documents. Now, many people there at our October event, sponsored by Waypoint, you received that already. And that, that document has three appendices. Uh, one appendix is this evaluation document. Another appendix is our vetting document that we give to a potential elder. And then there is another appendix that is the portion out of our bylaws describing the role, the work, et cetera, the function of an elder, how they're selected here at the Creek. So that's available on our website, e2elders.org, under products, scroll down, and it's a free download, okay? Let me just make sure, Jared, is that still there? Can you check? Okay, I have somebody checking to see if that is still uh, listed as a freebie. All right, well, the question here, uh, so you talked about peer evaluation among your elders, which I think most elderships are probably not doing intentionally. Uh, can you elaborate on the ways that you that that evaluation helps protect each other and how how it works to encourage each other? Was the question about that mm -hmm. evaluation? Sure. You know, uh, there are many scriptural uh, passages like Proverbs twenty seven seventeen: "As iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another." We need to invite people to speak into our lives, and I believe that an uh, an elder team. I don't call us an eldership, I call us a team. A team works together. It's not like a golf team where we go off and we play a game of golf individually and then we come back at the end of the match and we add up our scores to see or one. No, we're like a football team or we're like a basketball team. We have to interact with one another and a team goes out onto the floor or the gridiron to win and we've, we wanna play together. Even right now, all of us, we're on the same team. We've got one, one leader, his name is Jesus. We have one opposing team enemy, his name is Satan. And if we would work together Together as a team, we could be better. Now, a team will be healthy. Listen carefully. A team will be healthy if we are constantly in training, just like any football team or basketball team. They got to be practicing. All of these teams right now that are in the final four, they're practicing. Uh, and uh, you and I, we're, we're only going to be in training, learning if we're teachable in spirit. But now, listen, we will only be teachable in spirit if. We are humble at heart. And Jesus, if we're going to follow his example, Philippians chapter 2, 
Uh, verse 5 and following, uh, here Paul said that our attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. And then it goes on to say, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man, he, what's that next word? He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So you, and that word humble, it means to go to a lower place. Certainly he left his throne in heaven and he became, he put on flesh and he moved into our neighborhood. He came to a lower place. For you and for me, it means that we, we would go to a lower place, that like Jesus, humility means that we would be willing to, to serve one another and wash each other's feet. So if, if we're going to be accountable one to another, if we're going to protect and feed one another that which is spiritually rich, we got to be humble because only if we're humble will we be teachable in spirit. And if we're teachable in spirit, we're going to be a team that's constantly in training we, because we want to get better. We want to get better at uh, leading, serving uh, the bride and advancing against the kingdom of darkness. So that accountability form, we don't cringe every spring when we get it from David. We we lean into it. We know that we want it uh, so that we can speak the truth in love uh, to each other. Hey, listen, this, this is a good thought. Write down the book uh, by Patrick Lencioni. It's called The Advantage. It's a great book. It's not uh, about church leadership, but Patrick Lencioni has written some great books. He's an outstanding speaker and expert on leadership development. And uh, on page 60 of that book, I memorized this long ago. Beginning on page 60, Lencioni describes the, uh, uh, an exercise. He calls it the team effectiveness exercise. And it's a great exercise to do with your team. I did it with our staff, uh, and I can remember it well. Um, what happens is you you can't do it with, you know, 12 or 15 people. That's just too many. But so if you've got, I don't know, six, eight people in a circle around a table, uh, somebody has to start the ball rolling. And in so if I start, then I would turn to the, the for example, the elder next to me. And I would say, Steve, this is what I find in you to make that makes us so good as an elder team. And what I'm speaking about a and B, attitude and behavior. I'm not talking about his competency. I'm not talking about his skill. I'm talking about his attitude and his behavior. Steve, this is how you make us to be so good. And then I say that, affirming him in front of all of the other guys. And then I go to Mike and I say, Mike, this is what I see in you that makes us so good, your attitude, behavior. And then I go around the table. And then I'll say, hey, Steve, now it's your turn. You go around the table. What do you see in Mike? And so on. And by the time all six, eight of us have done that, it's an hour, hour and a half that's gone by. But when we're all done, we feel so affirmed and appreciated uh, by one another. Now we get up, take a break, get something to eat, drink, come back to the table. And then starting with me, I say, Steve, listen, buddy, I need you to tell me what attitude, what behavior do I manifest that hurts us the most as a team? What hurts us? Please, I, I need to know that because I'm accountable to Jesus to be the very best that I can be as a shepherd of his flock. And then Mike, speak into my life. And I'm writing down what they say, speak into my life. And we just go around the circle like that. And then after I'm done, hey, then Steve, can would, would it be all right if we speak into your life? Would you want us to do that? See, when you and I do that, we're leading by example. Paul said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. So this whole thought of peer accountability, if, if we're holding a staff accountable, we're doing annual reviews on the staff, why aren't we reviewing our leadership? Uh, it's the, the buck stops here uh, with with elders. We, we have to lead by example and, and want to have an examined life being held accountable. Um, so. All right. Uh, we've got time just for another question or two. Okay. Uh, so the next one is uh, you talked about as you grew, you had to kind of reinvent pastoral care and distribute that 
yep. uh, past the eldership. And so can you talk to us a little bit about what guided your decisions? Uh, oh, sure. Absolutely. From a, a small group mm -hmm. to a larger group. Right. So uh, when when we first came, January the 1st, 1990, uh, there were only 250 people here. The church was very broken. Uh, about a year, year and a half previous, it had gone through a hor horrible split. Uh, lots of brokenness. And um, so we established, and, and there were no elders when I arrived. None, zip, nada. And we immediately went into an elder search process. We invited elders from area Christian churches, sister congregations to come set our first elder team apart. And... Um, uh, then immediately, immediately we began the shepherding process. Well, with 250 people, you can uh, easily divide that group up among five, six guys. And we did all of the shepherding. We were on the front line. But as the Lord added to our number, those who were saved, those who were coming, and 250 became 500, 500 became 800, and so on, we had to keep reinventing the structure, the structure, the infrastructure of shepherding. You know, we went from, uh, okay, over in your neighborhood, you've got all of these people. Over in your neighborhood, south of Indianapolis, these are all your people. That's your territory. You shepherd them. So if somebody went into the hospital from that area, that elder did the ministry. Well, then we went into the alphabet. You do last names beginning A through D, and then you do E through H, and so on. Well, then after we outgrew that, then we were always looking for a new infrastructure. So then it finally dawned on us. Uh, our role is Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 11. That we, that Jesus, he gave some to be apostles, prophets, uh, evangelists, elders, etc., teachers, to equip God's people, to equip God's people for works of service, so that the whole body grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So our role, yes, is to do. We teach by doing, but we also then multiply ourselves. We reproduce ourselves in ministry. Hence, for example, at the Creek, we have Stephen's ministry. It's been here for more than 13 years. We've got about 130 people who have gone through the Stephen's ministry training. They've been set apart by the elders. Uh, our congregation knows them, loves them, embraces that huge, compassionate team who provides pastoral care. Doesn't mean that we're exonerated from pastoral care. We, we are still on the front line doing what we can in pastoral care, but we have certainly created an infrastructure to make certain that people are cared for. All right. One last question. Um, let's see. Uh, do, uh, do your elders meet with staff very specifically? Oh, yes. Uh, yes. And how do you do team building between staff and elders? That's huge. You know, if we're able uh, to have uh, another webinar uh, sometime this year, I want to teach our, uh, our um, organizational chart because it is very unique. It is so different. It's not vertical, uh, a vertical positional authority where we have trickle down authority. It doesn't look anything like that. So I'm not going to say anything more about it. Uh, that's for another day in time. But what I will say is this, because of the way that our organizational flow chart exists, it immediately puts elders into contact with staff. So here's an example. We have eight elders two are on staff. So take those two staff out. We, we now have six elders. Those six elders are fully integrated in staff relationships. Case in point, we got a, a guy uh, as an elder who is a missionary, uh, works with TCM, uh, which is a parachurch organization of the Independent Christian Church. David he connects with all of our global outreach, local outreach staff members. He knows them. He has befriended them. He does a lot of things with them. Uh, another guy on our staff team, David, he is an accomplished musician. Even though his ministry or his vocation is in the world of business, IT, David went to Ozark. He was in, in Impact Brass years ago. He is a very gifted, talented musician, and he walks closely with everyone on staff in worship and the creative arts. 
He knows them. He has lunch with them. He befriends them and so on. Each one of our elders has said by their gifting what staff team they want to be responsible for to walk with them, to shepherd that group of people. And it's incredible. By the way, too, every one of our elders meetings, we invite staff to come have supper with us. Last week, we had all of our children's staff with us around the table eating supper to get to know them all the better, they to get to know us. They shared their dreams of children's ministry. And after that conversation and that dinner was over, the elders uh, laid hands on those five individuals and prayed a prayer blessing and protection over them. The next day, my inbox had emails from the children's staff team. They were just so moved uh, because they, they say this, we, we know that we are known, we are valued, and we are loved by the elders at the creek. And that, it's just really incredible. Um, and I'm so grateful for it. So I would love to share insights on that someday at another webinar, uh, if the good Lord Jesus makes that opportunity possible. Yeah. Well, we're going to get feedback uh, from folks, but, but uh, we're all in on that. We'll have to pick the date and let our guys know. We're, we've got just a couple minutes to wrap up. And uh, so hopefully I can, uh, let's see if I can share the screen properly uh, here. Um, and I'll go back to this. But guys, thanks for joining our very first webinar. And we want to thank uh, very much in particular. Um, well, that's not working. Come on. Uh, our sponsor, uh, Mid Atlantic Christian University, and uh, they sponsored our whole series. I want to tell you about our next seminar that's coming up in two weeks. Uh, it's on Thursday night, April uh, the 6th at 7 p.m., and it's called How to Stay Out of Jail. And it's for preachers and uh, church treasurers and bookkeepers to talk about compliance, or legal compliance in a complex world in 2017. And uh, so, uh, so you can register for that. There will be a link in the automated email that you get tomorrow. There'll be a link to register for that. And so if you're an elder or someone else, you can forward that link to someone in your church that might be in that kind of category that would want to join that webinar uh, on Thursday night coming up in just a little over two weeks. Uh, I also uh, want to uh, tell you, remind you that we'll also have in that automated email uh, Gary's website, the E2 Elders uh, website so that you can look for those resources. And, um, and I'm going to do one more thing here. We, we answered about half the questions, and we're going to see if we can, uh, this is new to us, but I think we'll have the ability to try to answer the unanswered questions after the fact via email. So uh, if hopefully that'll work and uh, get back with you here within the next few days about that. Uh, the last thing I'd like to say, uh, of course, is we're really glad that you've been part of our webinar, uh, particularly uh, elders that came together as a team for this, that you're, you're together at the church, you know, maybe in the preacher's office, and as we finish up here uh, tonight, maybe you'll you take some notes, and there's some really good conversations you can have about uh, your elder team doing a great job leading the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, and uh, so we're really glad that you've done that. This is a free webinar. It, you were able to log in and, and uh, register for free. Uh, we're glad that uh, MacU, of course, has been our sponsor to pay for our our uh, platform that allows us to do this. But the only ask that we have of you uh, that are on this webinar tonight uh, is that you would consider either supporting Waypoint or supporting Waypoint more next year. Uh, that we do all kinds of service for the body of Christ in this region, in Virginia, North Carolina, and the Mid-Atlantic. We start new churches. We have a new church that started just uh, two days ago on Sunday in Jacksonville, North Carolina. Had 200 people attending at a brand new church. And we will be planting six churches this year in 2017. And we do that because we have churches that support the ministry of Waypoint. So this is a free webinar, but it gives me the opportunity for a 30-second ask to consider supporting Waypoint next year in your budget, in missions, or to support us more. Uh, so uh, that's my job as the executive director to make that ask. So uh, thanks for your time. Well, it is 8.55 on my clock, and we're going to finish right on time. So thanks again for joining us. Um, Stay tuned for the email for the, for the follow-up follow -up links that you can join. And we hope to book a Gary again soon and watch your emails uh, for the promotion materials on that. So have a great evening. There we go. I'm going to end the meeting. <laughs>